This episode of the Topcast is presented in collaboration with our friends over at Sheet Music Plus. I am able to provide piano classes for them. That means that they're getting that opportunity and an opportunity that we all know is so wonderful for them. And I also believe that by doing, because the way that I do my groups, I use 61 key keyboards, which means if they have a 61 key keyboard at home, that's okay. So in other words, that makes it more accessible for them as well. And I do find that they gradually um, move on to a a full-size piano, but they can start on a keyboard and that's okay with the curriculum I use. Hello there, wonderful teachers. Welcome back to the Topcast. No, I am not Tim Topham, as you may have noticed. If you haven't met me before, my name is Nicola Canton and I run my own podcast, vibrant music teaching podcast and I also do some work here at Top Music so Tim has asked me to do another one of my takeover shows here this week. We're going to be talking with Melanie Bose today and I'm really excited to share this with you because I think Melanie has such a interesting perspective on group teaching. Now if you are absolutely sure that you never want to do group teaching I want to encourage you to listen anyway. There's definitely something here for everyone, including just understanding how to differentiate things for different levels of students and some things to do with how Melanie taught online a little bit and bits and pieces that I think are applicable for every type of teacher. Now, if you haven't met Melanie before, let me tell you a little bit about her. Melanie Bowes is the founder of Keynotes Music a group piano program which focuses on collaborative group learning in the foundation stages of piano. Having taught for many years as a school music teacher, plus with her extensive postgraduate qualifications in music education, Melanie has brought together all of her experience and knowledge to support teachers in delivering innovative and progressive group classes. Melanie's work in curriculum design and research into how children learn in the wider sense have led to the creation of Keynotes Music, which uses a cyclical curriculum structure and differentiated learning to ensure maximum impact on learning and the management of individual learners within group classes. So let's dive into the interview with Melanie. So Melanie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me here. Oh, it's awesome to have you. So I want to start with us taking a little journey together into my imagination. So I want you to imagine that I'm a teacher that thinks the idea of group lessons sounds pretty cool. I've been thinking about it for a little while. I think, oh, I want to teach fewer hours. I want to make my lessons more social for the kids and more affordable for parents in my community because they're struggling to pay. So, first of all, will group teaching do these things? Am I right? Are there any misconceptions or common myths that people have? Uh, Yes, absolutely, group lessons will do these things. Um, Obviously, you can teach more children in less time. And, in fact, we can say that in terms of the lessons being social, um, that can make it kind of more fun in a way for kids. But also, we know that learning happens in a more impactful way when it's social. So we know that when children are learning with peers, they are able, they're obviously able to play games, they're able to do ensembles, etc. But it's the actual act of learning collaboratively with others and everything that brings from observing how different learners access the learning to being inspired by others. That means that social learning is, as I say, really impactful. Um, for me, the affordability of parents is so important. Like, I love the accessibility of my classes. Um, before the pandemic, when I was teaching in a school for one afternoon and on Saturday afternoons, I was teaching 135 kids from one very small area. Now, there is no way that, A, all of those parents would have been able to afford private piano lessons and b that they would have even been able to find a teacher (laughs) can you imagine all of those children would definitely not have been able to find a teacher so I was able to provide or I am able to provide piano classes for them that means that they're getting that opportunity and an opportunity that we all know is so wonderful for them and 
I also believe that by doing, because the way that I do my groups, I use 61 key keyboards, which means if they have a 61 key keyboard at home, that's okay. So in other words, that makes it more accessible for them as well. And I do find that they gradually um, move on to a, a full size piano, but they can start on a keyboard and that's okay with the curriculum I use. So yeah, wow. I, love, I love the accessibility point of group piano. Absolutely. And I think that's going to be a controversial statement, but that's wonderful. We love that here on the Topcast. So you start with those types of keyboards. Now tell me, what will I need my imaginary teacher self? Let's call her Anne. What does Anne need to set this up business-wide? What's she going to need to invest in? I'm guessing some of those keyboards. Yes, I think that is probably your teaching space and the keyboards are probably the biggest stumbling block for a lot of teachers that I speak to. They, Although, having said which, when I speak to them, they do imagine that they they need space for like uh, six full-size digital pianos. And then when I explain to them, that actually they can start, you know, if you're starting your kids at age four or five, which, by the way, was another point, you can open your classes to a whole new um, age group if you do groups. But if you're starting your kids at age four or five um, and then... We also have beginners age six plus. It's perfectly okay for them to start on 61 keys. And so so therefore you won't need quite as much space. Um, I do think they still need one each. But, you know, you can do what I did at the beginning was I did a kind of soft launch where I started with fewer kids than I knew I would eventually want to teach so that I could just have a couple of keyboards Um, I think I started with four and now actually in the classroom that I hire I have 15 but I don't use all 15. (laughs) Um, So I think a soft launch is also a really great way to kind of test it out and for you to get used to the idea of teaching groups and everything that comes with it. Oh that's wonderful. So what about the teaching space then? You mentioned wrenching a classroom. Mm-hmm. Is that the ideal way for Anne to get started? Are there any other places she should check out? Well it really depends on where Anne is based <laughs> because we find that in the UK and often in Australia as well um, mm-hmm. teachers are being very creative with finding different places to hire um, like you know church halls um, community centers I first started off in a library which is hilarious because obviously you have to be quiet but they did have a separate room to hire and I think it's really like some of some of the teachers I know will just take their keyboards around to their different locations um, in the US and Canada I think that there is a lot more in the way of commercial teaching spaces that people have Um, and also just more space in their own houses so (laughs) but you can you know you don't have to set up your keyboards permanently you can put them away if you wanted to use your sitting room or something yeah so it's just thinking creatively around the teaching space absolutely and you're so right I think those in North America large parts of North America underestimate how small our houses are I should say yeah. overestimate their size <laughs> yes we do not absolutely. have the space you have <laughs> no we do not okay so what does Anne need to change about her teaching them when she's got her set up in place how is she going to need to adjust her teaching for a group format so I think when you have if you if you're very used to teaching privately you're used to having your different children and their different needs, their different characteristics, their different learning styles, and being able to focus purely on them for their half an hour and adjusting your approach to that one person. But if you can imagine having, I don't know, six or eight children together, and they've all got different learning styles and all got different learner needs, then you're going to have to have strategies and plans in place to provide for them so for example with the learning styles you might have your visual learners your auditory learners and your kinesthetic learners so you're making sure that your plans cover in terms of the learning that you want to cover your plans cover all of those different learning styles so that everyone is able to access the learning um, you know in their own way also and I think we'll probably get onto this uh, a little more in a minute I think that 
being able to plan for different rates of progress is really important. So you have to change um, your approach in that sense. There is a big mindset approach change with um, how the learners progress. And for example, in groups, I think we're so well set up to kind of repeat concepts and go in a cycle. I call it a spiral. It's a cyclical structure that you need but you're kind of spiraling because as you go up the, the spiral, the, the learning is being more deeply embedded. But obviously you need a plan for that. And, and it means that the first time that someone comes across a concept, they might not necessarily grasp it to the, the level that you would want, but you just know through your plans and through your kind of evaluation of each lesson, you need to revisit it. And that's okay. Mm, yeah that's definitely going to be an adjustment for many teachers although I would say it's kind of good teaching for one-on-one lessons as well that you are circling back on concepts and revisiting them to make sure that learning becomes more and more embedded so it sounds like that's built into how you teach groups absolutely yeah yeah indeed okay so tell me Anne is pretty nervous but she's also excited what mistakes is she likely to make in the first year? So I think this really depends on um, Anne's past experience. So um, if she has o- literally only been teaching individual lessons, she might be quite nervous about managing behaviour. And I think that sometimes because you you think, well, and I know that I've been guilty of this myself because my background was actually teaching much older students, like 18 year olds, where I wasn't really having to worry about the behavior. When I started teaching kind of four year olds, you realize that music is a really fun subject. Piano is something that we want them to love and enjoy. So you don't want to go in and be all kind of like, oh, strict and these are my boundaries. But at the same time, you do need boundaries and you do need to make your expectations really clear to the kids. And there are little things, little mistakes that I think teachers can make in their first year, such as little tiny things like making sure that you're um you've got a space for them to do learning away from the keyboard so that they're not playing around with the keyboard while you're talking and while you're doing some you know teacher modeling um you can have things like plugging the keyboards uh, the headphones into the keyboard if you're using headphones so that you know they're not they're so intrigued by the keyboard and piano that they want to just play it so you've got to manage those kinds of things so I think behavior is a big one I think also we were talking a little bit about misconceptions earlier I think one myth is to think that you could take your approach with individual students and just apply it to groups without much thought (laughs) and without much um, change in in your approach as we're saying And you might think, right, I'll start this group of beginners off and they're all kind of moving along nicely through this individual method book. But actually, it very quickly changes. And I've noticed that even from the first lesson, I'm doing different things with different students. And that's because they are also different. And some of them are very good at the concept. Some of them are very good at the practical, you know, playing, etc. So I think um, people find that they might have this situation where everyone's progressing at different rates and also after a year maybe a couple of children leave the group so say you had a group of six and a couple of children leave for whatever reason you can't bring any new children into the group Mm. that's quite a big problem that teachers come across as well that flexibility um, of being able to add new learners in the year um, which you know is really important business wise as well as anything else (laughs) very true okay I think we've gotten Anne off to a great start let's talk more (laughs) generally about some of the principles of group teaching and (laughs) your particular perspective and how you handle it because there are many different ways of doing a group teaching model so first of all you mentioned headphones there is that a big part of how you teach lessons or not so much so I think headphones are such an interesting and sometimes divisive um, matter. Um, so, so people kind of, there's often been talk of like, I teach headphone lessons or I teach non-headphone lessons. And I think group pianos become this massive umbrella term. 
because sometimes you'll say someone will say I especially find it when people are asking questions about group piano and one of my first questions back to them is are you teaching collaborative group piano where everyone's learning the same piece together at the same time or are you teaching um more like headphone lessons so everyone is learning independently everyone could be in completely different books they just happen to be sitting in the room together so they've got their headphones on the teacher goes around and gives kind of mini private lessons to everyone to me those are two completely different styles of um, group teaching so for me so then when people say see that I use headphones they kind of assume that I'm teaching those types of lessons but I'm not but I think headphones are really important and I'll tell you why. Um, when, if we're send, if we're kind of doing a song, so I teach the same song to everyone. And if we're doing a song together and, and I, I do some teacher modelling at the main piano, everyone's standing around me. I call it my Julie Andrews moment, Maria Von Trapp. <laughs> and, and we're kind of, I'm playing a song, we're singing it, et cetera. Then we go to the keyboards and we might do something all together out loud on the keyboards just to establish a, a learning point that if I know that there's something particular that they might get wrong with a fingering or something, we might just do that bar or measure right. together. Um, then I need them to have their headphones on because if I'm saying that they can all continue to play out loud, there are a few things that I'm assuming. I'm assuming that they can all play the piece straight away, which means there's not enough challenge in the piece. Yeah. We need them to practice it. We need them to work at it. Um, if I if I send a, a student to a keyboard and they're playing the piece, they're able to play it straight away, then I, I know that I haven't given them something with enough um, depth of challenge. So so the and the other reason is um, for developing learning characteristics. I really like that group piano can develop like a sense of independence and problem solving. So they've got their headphones on and they are practicing, they're making mistakes and they are working on them. And my job is to go around very quickly and often and help them, but also to move them on to the next challenge which we have challenge levels for each piece so if I say right okay you've mastered that version of the piece he next you're going to add this um so it's kind of I do a mix of giving feedback and you know noticing anything that I it's really good because I you can very quickly see um, who you need to go to first etc when they're on their headphones and you can see them practicing and you can give really timely feedback so as soon as they, you've seen them make a mistake you can go to them and say oh I've just noticed you, you haven't got the correct finger on that or whatever but yeah it's that ability to be able to give that individual instruction and for them to develop their sense of practicing and improving and working on something basically so that's why I have key headphones I don't have them for very long because mm. then we take the headphones out and they all play it to each other I give feedback one point of what I loved one point of something to do next even if there were 10 things they need to improve on I'll just give the one and I'll try and mix my comments around the children so that they've all heard each other's comments and can hopefully pick up on them and then we play it all together as an ensemble like with a backing track and things. So there's lots of work out loud, but there is also that headphone work. So it's a mm. great question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really interesting to hear that approach because from the outside looking in at group teaching, like I do group workshops and buddy lessons, but I don't do group groups, right, mm -hmm. apart from with preschoolers. And from the outside looking in, I've always seen that dichotomy of there's those group teachers who think everyone should play together. And then there's those who teach a, what I think of as side by side mm -hmm. solo lessons, right? Yeah. They're just individual lessons, but everyone is together because <laughs> you're hopping around. Yeah. So it's interesting to hear how you incorporate almost that second option into in a small way into what you're doing, although they're playing yeah. the same piece. Yeah, and you've got the benefits, the true benefits of groups in terms of learning together and having all the same objectives, being able to play the same games, they're all at exactly the same level in terms of their understanding and their concept, I think can only happen in a collaborative setting. Um, but I have also, you know, heard teachers be very alarmed that um, in a collaborative setting we use headphones, but that's the reason. Mm. 
Yeah. That's really interesting. I want to make sure everyone can visualize this super clearly. So you're demonstrating, you've got your Julie Andrews moment <laughs> <laughs> where they're all gathered around the piano. And those yeah. who get that reference will get it. Most people should get that. And yeah. then they go back to their individual instruments and that's where they put on the headphones and that's really practice time. And during that time, you're hopping around to certain ones of them. Now, you're not like, you're not super tech studio where they're all plugged in and you're hearing all of them or or able to tune into different people. You're just watching oh, to know if no. they played the wrong finger by yeah. watching. Yeah. yeah. And I also, I, so I do, that's also a great point because I do tend to have two headphones plugged into each keyboard so that I can go around and listen in. Um, when I say that I can very quickly take a look at the class and very quickly spot who's kind of not on the right note or this is my kind of my preschool class, my age four to five, where they're in playing C's and D's or whatever. Mm. And I can see that they're actually on A and B. And so I go and help them. Um, as the classes become more advanced, yes, I would go and listen on the other set of headphones. But you're right. I've heard of so many teachers who have a way more advanced tech setup than I do um, with, you know, being able to listen in, being able to meet people, being able to do all sorts of things, um, which I think in some countries is just more established. Like I know that there are some secondary schools, high schools here who have that kind of system but I as a high school teacher I never came across it so this is the way I've always done it um, yeah yeah and just trust that everyone's on task if someone's finger creeps up to the buttons on the keyboard and, and you say oh dear I think we have a keyboard gremlin in the room <laughs> but yeah it's uh if if you're giving them enough of a challenge then hopefully they should be staying on task or if it's if it's too easy or too difficult that's where you might find the the on task behavior kind of digresses but um yeah but you can see right from, level challenge you can see from what they're playing and you can also see from their furrowed brow if they're not getting <laughs> it um I'm sure and it's oh, a great so tip much. to have a second set of headphones plugged in with a splitter or if there's two yes. slots in the keyboard that's great. exactly yeah you're right there's so much around body language and facial expressions and that was for me something that I really missed when we had to go online is that I couldn't really see those things so it's mm. made it very tricky but yeah, in person, it's much, much more straightforward to be able to notice all of those things, those little subtleties Beautiful. that we get so used to as teachers. Yeah. And then to finish my little summary of what you were describing, they then take the headphones out, they each play individually, and then they play as a group. Is that right? Exactly. Because I want to know that individually, I want to know where they've got to, whether they are playing fluently. Um, what I need to do in, in the way of feedback I also write little notes home to parents so um, and I can then make sure that I am providing the support that each individual needs so I, I do want to hear them individually and also it means that they become such good performers because they are performing yeah. from day one there is no I don't want to do it. I I will not that that doesn't happen in my class and mm. um, if they don't want to do it in the very first lesson, I will get them to do something or I will really help them, like give them a big crutch, like, you know, be with them and kind of helping them press the keys down and then make a big, you know, fuss about it, like big clap, yay, you did it. Because from day one, we want them performing and, and they become super confident performers because mm. of that. But then I also want them to experience like one of the, many benefits of group piano which is ensemble playing I want them to experience that ensemble playing together so we either we have a mix of things we either just play you know there might be different versions of the piece going on and we play it together so it sounds a bit like it's a true ensemble but actually they're all playing the same song or as they get more advanced we have lots of duets solos etc I'm uh, sorry ensembles etc that we will play together as well Mm, fantastic okay mm. so I think that leads into our next question which is the most common one I have heard about group lessons which is what do you do when a student is behind or ahead of the class yes I think this is such an important issue um, and if we can if we can get this right then I think you know we've got an absolutely fantastic setting for our students but if we don't get it right I think it can actually be 
less than satisfactory. <laughs> so, um, so what I do, and bearing in mind that I said, you know, it's very difficult to just take a, a, a book that is designed for individual lessons and say, right, next piece, next piece, next piece, because everyone will want to move on to the next piece at different times. That's just the way it is from day one. So what we do is we have something, we have a strategy for differentiating each piece. And that means that we have four difficulty levels. We call them challenge levels. So I say, right, this is challenge one, this is challenge two, challenge three, challenge four. And basically with each challenge, we're adding more difficulty to the song. So we're adding depth to each song rather than the difficulty being that it moves on with the book, the difficulty can happen in each individual song. And I do get students who come in and they're kind of complete wizards from the beginning and I can straight away, you know, get them either playing in octaves or playing um, an independent left hand that might be slightly, you know, just the bass um, or even playing chords. Um, my last challenge that I give to them if I need to is um, to add Alberti bass. Um, and then I've even done it where I um, ask them to transpose to a different key. Obviously, they then can't play with everyone else. But um, there are so many things that you can do to add difficulty to each piece. It's not so easy with some um, method books I've found, especially where the melody passes through the hands. Mm. But um, but that's that's how we do it. And then as they get older and more experienced, we have um, duets and ensembles and within like within the ensemble there might be three parts but we've structured it so that they could play just one of the parts or play two of the parts in one hand because it might be question and answer in the right hand right. or all three parts so cause and left hand question and answer in the right hand so you might have what's that like five different things going on at the same time mm. with the different learners and then we also have these um what we call build it up solos so you have a piece that everyone learns together and say, right, this is a piece. And then what we found is that sometimes a student might come back the next lesson and they say, well, I've, I've mastered it and they're playing it, they're playing it really well. You can obviously add nuance and things, but they're, they're playing it fluently. But other children in the class aren't yet. So that's the struggle that people would have. Like, what do I do with this one child? Do I get out another piece entirely? But for me, if we've got these kind of learning objectives that we want everyone to achieve, I want my pieces to contain those learning points. And so therefore, what we do with these build up solos, everyone learns the same thing. And then there's literally another written out version where we add in a voicing, maybe some chords in the left hand instead of a single line. And then there might be another version where we add um, a counter melody in the right hand or just inner voicing like an alto line in the right hand. So that you could you can say, right, you've done the first version, you can move on to the second version. But as I say, it's actually written out. In my earlier classes, my beginner classes, it's more I'm just telling them how to add the challenge. Right. Okay. And that's how we manage it. I mean, it is an, a big, big, big task and a lot of strategy and planning. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really interesting. Thank you for describing that. Okay. One concern I guess teachers might have now is does the child who never gets to challenge two end up feeling lesser than in some way in that class? Yeah, I, I've never, never had that issue because I guess because we go, we're, we, we've got this cyclical structure that means that we might have a mix of children, some that have already done two books and some that are on their first book. So there's, I guess, that expectation that they're going to be at different points with yeah. each piece. However, what I find is that it's more of a motivational kind of setup. So the, the, the child that doesn't move on to challenge two is actually probably moves on to challenge two sooner than they would otherwise because they can see other children doing it. So I really like to have that mix. Um, they really, the, the ones that are moving on really motivate the ones that aren't. And we set it up so that, and, and my language to the children is always based around effort, always based around mm -hmm. commitment and practice at home. You can't, it's moving on from challenge one to challenge two isn't anything to do with ability. A natural talent it's to do with how much effort you're putting in 
Mm. and how you apply your you know your learning how you apply yourself how and these are all really important life lessons for children if we can teach them those things through music which we certainly can then you know that's wonderful okay Mm. yeah I love that so last sort of area then of questions is about general progress do you find that you're, I know you haven't taught private lessons, so it might be difficult to compare, but do you think your students in groups make better progress in some areas and slower progress in other areas of music in general? I think um, we, I think in groups we learn incredibly creatively. So we're, we're doing, um, we're not just playing the piano, we're doing games, as you know all about, um, but also improvising, composing, listening. And because our books are topic based, so we have like a book called Music from the Movies, um, everything that they're learning about is how music can illustrate the different movie genres. And so they're learning all about the musical elements, instrumentation, you know, all of that kind of stuff that just wouldn't happen in individual classes, individual lessons. I think for me, and I don't think that this is necessarily applicable to all group teachers, I think that just the way that my classroom is set up, I think that I would have to think very, I would have to think about technique with my students because they are not sitting in the ideal position. They are not, they're using touch sensitive keyboards rather than weighted um, or even semi-weighted pianos. So if, you know, my, some of my students have moved on to one-to-one and they've gone through the exam, and they've done really, really well. So I know that it's not an issue long-term, but I also know that I need to focus a little bit on the technique side of things within my classes but as I say lots of teachers especially in as you say North America they have these amazing Mm. digital pianos that are fully weighted and um, perhaps it's not such an issue for them. Yeah and they have more scope but I mean in any no matter what your setup you need to hold students accountable to that technique as a teacher I suppose so it always falls back to us in the end. It does. (laughs) Yeah. So, Melanie, tell us more about keynotes, because this whole system that you've been describing is your program that other teachers can use as well. So can you tell us where that came from, why you wanted to set it up and what it involves? Sure. So um, I was a secondary school teacher, which is secondary school is kind of, I think it's the end of middle school and then high school. So it changes 11 to 18. And I was head of music in um, a, a amazing second school I love teaching there and um, then obviously had children and found that it was very difficult to do both jobs well mother and uh, head of music so I dropped down to one day a week at school and decided what at around the same time as this my own son started doing cello lessons and I really felt as a mum that the younger you can start, um, the better, but you can't just start with anyone at age three or four because it's, it's very difficult to teach um, a, a very young student one-to-one. So we um, enrolled him into um, with a Suzuki teacher. Um, Suzuki do privates and groups, as, as you may know. And around the same time, I was telling his friend's mum that I was doing, that Reuben had started cello lessons and and they said, oh, I, my child loves music because, you know, most parents know that their children respond to music. And we have like we have toddler, baby toddler music programs here. But then there's really beyond three, there's really nothing for them until they start private lessons age more like six or seven. So some of the mums say my child really loves music, um, but there's just I, I'm not ready for individual lessons and neither are they. And so um you know what is there out there and I was like okay well I can set something up that's fine so basically my classes looked a lot like my the classes I was doing for 11 to 14 year olds but just for the younger age so um that's why it's very kind of topic based and etc but I guess what's unique about keynotes is that I've brought my experience and knowledge of teaching 30 kids at a time 
and having, you know, when you have a, an inspector come into your classroom, they want to see that all 30 children are making outstanding progress. And that's pro- outstanding progress from where they're at. And in the school I taught at, I was teaching kids that had never touched a musical instrument before to kids who were grade eight piano. And when I'm talking, that's the spectrum I had. So my ability to differentiate, but also to be very inclusive and not make those kids that hadn't had any experience in music um, feel like they couldn't progress because that is a big problem. Um, So I brought all of that experience into the Keynotes programme and then my experience with younger children um, and, and general you know, learning. Um, I've got various degrees about all of this kind of thing. So that's how it all started, um, really. And and it's been an amazing journey of then other teachers wanting to use the programme. And and so now it's like a a licence where people can use it in their studios and and teach their groups using the programme. Fantastic. And I believe Top Music Pro members who are listening can get a discount. So you can check that out in our discount section as well. Absolutely. I think we're so well aligned with Top Music Pro because it's all about disrupting the, you know, the just being kind of really, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Forward thinking or? Yes. Yeah. And just just taking a different approach and being very child-centered, child-led. Mm. Um, I think that's really important. I sometimes think that we need to move away from what's equivalent to almost chalk and talk. Um, I say you do, and kind of being very much led by by the children and how they learn best. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for giving us this overview of group teaching and your philosophies on it. It's been really interesting to hear about. Can you tell us your website so people can find more about Keynotes? Sure. <laughs> sure. It's um, keynotes-music.com. Beautiful. And of course, the link will be in the show notes as well. Thank you so much, Melanie. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode today and staying with us, even though it's not the usual Tim show today. I hope you enjoyed this break in the structure and a different voice in your earbuds. If you did enjoy the show, of course, we'd always appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening. And I hope you'll join us back here next week. If you want to connect with me, if you have a question for Melanie, we are both available inside the Top Music Pro forums for members, or you can find us on Facebook. Just tag us in the Top Music group. We'll see you there. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio, from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.